We are continuing our series, Living on Purpose. This is the sixth sermon in the series out of seven, so we'll finish up next week. And it coincides with the work that six of our people are doing. Three men and three women are going through Workplace Discipleship Initiative with Jim Lipinski and Darren Ho, who were here a few weeks ago. And they've been going through the devotional as well. And some of you have been going through that devotional also. And so we're just going through the same topics with them. So this week, as we kick off week six, it leads into the week six of the devotional. Now, if you're not doing the devotional, or you don't have a copy, and you would like one, we do have extra copies, so just let me know after the service, and we can help get one to you. So, so far, we've been through five other weeks. We started out with seeing God at the, as the center now this started as talking about how we can live out our faith in the workplace and in all of our areas of influence. But we didn't start by talking about tips of how to witness to your friends or how to get them to come to church. Rather, we started talking about how God is the center of everything. The centrality of Christ to our lives, to our behavior, to our vocation. It is God that has to be taking the center stage. And then we moved on and we talked about following the vision. As we see God at the center, it's all about His vision. And then we moved on to viewing work from God's perspective. So if it's God's at the center and it's His vision, then He has a, a view of your work and of all of our work and what we do. And how does that play into His plan? Not just going to work to earn an income or be able to pay the bills, but there's something greater. The idea that we've long talked about here at this church, that when you leave here, as most of you will, as we have a, such a transient population, we want you to leave here not simply going on to the next job or the next mission that the oil company or NATO has for you, but we want you to be sent as a missionary on a secular payroll, seeing that God has a mission and a purpose for you in your work. And then we went on to the fourth week about how we have to make decisions with a kingdom mindset. We don't always think about this, but every decision we make, there's a kingdom implication. And then in part five, we talked about loving with radical love. God is love, and this is going to be the biggest key. It's, it's the witness we have in John chapter 13, that the world will know we're Christ's disciples. How? By us standing and preaching on street corners, or by us wearing t-shirts that say it, or putting fish on our cars? No, it simply says, by the love we have for one another. But sadly, how many people have you met that left the church because there was a lack of love within the church? Because they felt that they didn't, they didn't feel loved and accepted even here. Now the idea should be that we have such a radical love for one another as a family, that we care more about each other than we do about the differences that may divide us, that that then spreads out into our other areas of influence. That people at work are loved with a radical love, and people in our neighborhood, and people on the bus going to work, and people who may be in our extended family and abroad. And so the radical love should start here. That's the first step. If we don't have it in our church, then we're hopeless. But as we see God's love within the church family, it should spread beyond. And that's what attracts people to want to become part of Christ's family. So now finally, as we come to part six, we have living out in the open. It's where the devotional finally starts to get into some thoughts on how you actually bear witness in the workplace. And for many people, they think, well, why does it take five weeks to get here? But hopefully you see if you've been a part of the series, and if you haven't, you can catch all the videos, all the sermons are on YouTube to see what you've missed. And it's really important that we build the foundation, because it's not simply about having a few tips or tricks. It's about really living the life God's called us to live. And so now, as we've gotten those other five areas out of the way, we move into how do we live out in the open? Now, when Jim was here with us a couple of weeks ago, he spoke about his own story. And he says that he was scared, really scared. It's normal to be scared to think about, but if I live out in the open for Christ, what are people going to think of me? What will they say? Will it hurt my career? These are normal feelings. Peter was scared. He denied Christ three times. Peter was scared. Again, after Jesus had already ascended and he's hanging out with Gentiles and then some Jews come to town and he starts to stay away from the Gentiles because he doesn't think that the other Jews will like him associating with the Gentiles. It was racism, plain and simple. It's easy for us to be scared to do what Christ has called us to do. But then the question is, who are we trying to honor? 
But today I want us to go back. I want us to look at, the, at where this is based. Where do we get this idea of living out in the open? And it really goes all the way back to Genesis, as everything does theologically. We build our whole theology out of the book of Genesis. And so we're going to be looking in just a moment at Genesis chapter 1. But before we get there, let's pray, and then we'll read. God, as we come today to talk about living out in the open, I'm reminded that in Revelation you talk about those who are thrown into the pit of fire, and it starts out with the cowards. And it's not how we normally think. We think about great sins, about murder or adultery or stealing. But yet, you start the list out by saying cowards are the ones that go to hell. God, you've called us to live courageously. You told Paul, through Paul, you told Timothy that you've not given him a spirit of timidity. And yet, we're so often guilty of being timid. God, we pray this morning you would help us to live courageous lives. We're willing to be on mission for you and remember that that's the main thing. That we keep you at the center and we keep your mission in sight. We pray this morning as we come to the scriptures, you'd help this to become clear in our minds, both what you intend for us as a church family, as well as what you call each of us to individually. Pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. This was the plan from the beginning. We read in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Now you may be wondering, how is this about living out in the open for Christ? But you see, in the very beginning, God creates humanity in His image. And that means a number of things. The fact that we have a, a pension to create things is part of that. God created ex nihilo, out of nothing. We create out of what God has given us. But another meaning this carries is the fact that we are to represent Him. And it's, it's amazing to see people light up as they get this. I travel all over the world and I, and I get to teach on this. It's one of our, the basic things that we need to understand as a God's calling on our lives. And so I'll ask and I'll be somewhere like Sam can testify in Uganda. And I'll say, now if you go to the post office, whose picture is hanging there? You'll say, well, the president. Well, if you go to the police station, whose picture is hanging there? Oh, the president. Now think about it. In many of your home countries, it's either the king, the president, the dictator. Somebody's image is going to be found in public buildings. Why is it there? Because they want you to know who's in charge. They want you to remember who... They want the employees to remember who they're working for. They want the people coming in to use the services to remember who they have to thank for it. This is how it's done. It's been done like this for thousands of years. Now, it didn't used to be pictures. It used to be statues. Statues of Caesar, statues of the king. Why do they do that? Because they want to remind people who's in charge, who they need to honor. Well, you see, when God put us here as his image, this made perfect sense to the original readers. They understood why images were used. As Moses wrote these words down and gave it to the Israelites, they surely remembered Im images of Pharaoh being up around Egypt that it reminded them who they served. And now they are being told, actually, you are an image of the great king of the universe, of the God Almighty. You've been slaves in Egypt, toiling under the rule of the Pharaoh, but in reality... You are not simply a, a slave to God. You're a child of God, made in His image and made to represent Him on earth to the rest of creation. The rest of creation, the, the birds of the air, the beasts of the field, they're not made in the image of God. And so we are here as a reminder to them and to represent Him, like regional governors taking care of this earth of creation. So then we read, when we read in Romans chapter 8... Verse 29. And we read, For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. So here in Romans, we read Paul writing that God has called Christians to be made into the image of Christ. 
You see, we were created in the image of God, but then there was the fall, and we have sin, and we need to be redeemed, reconciled to God the Father. And as a part of that reconciliation, as a part of our, of our calling and justification, we have sanctification. We're being made into the image of Christ. And it relates right back there to Genesis. That God wants us to represent Him not only to the created order, as it was in Genesis, but now to the fallen world. So that when the fallen world looks around, they can see an image of God. Just like when somebody goes to that post office in Uganda and they see the president there, and they're reminded who's in charge, it's supposed to be that when people in this fallen world look around and they see you, they go, and they're pointed to Christ. They're pointed to God the Father. But is that what's happening? Do people in your circles of influence get pointed to God when they see you? Are you so clearly in the image of Christ that people see Christ and they look right through you and right to the face of the Father? Because that's our calling. So you can see how it relates from God's initial plan in Genesis. It's still the same thing, but now with the redeemed people to point a fallen world to Him. So we've been called in Matthew chapter 5. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a, uh, <clears throat> a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. And then it says in the same way, we need to let our light shine before others. Do we let our light shine? It's a, we hear that phrase, we may think about the children's song about this little light of mine. Unfortunately, sometimes that makes us think it's something about when we were children. But Jesus is talking to his followers here. We are called to be a light. We are called to be a city on a hill. It was really cool this last week when I was in Bangkok. I was riding from the airport to the hotel. And I knew the church was close to the hotel. When we churned on Soy 2, off of Sukhumvit, if you know Bangkok, off the main road onto one of the side streets, way, way far in the distance, right in the middle of the road, there was a giant lit up cross. It was nighttime, and I could see this giant cross. I thought, oh, I bet that's the church. And sure enough, that was the church that we were meeting at this past week. But to see that light spreading out, to see it so clearly, one street over from a red light district, right there in the midst of all kinds of, of temples, false religion, so much idol worship that I saw this week, people praying and begging Buddhas for all sorts of things. I saw people praying and begging for children at a Buddha for fertility. I saw people praying for any, any number of things. People putting coins in bowls, praying that their wishes would come true. And as you see such darkness, it's such a clear there that there's a church that's being a light. They light their cross up every night so that people, and you can see it right there from the main road from Sukhumvit. You see this cross. It was great because if I went out at night to dinner and came back and I got lost, I could always find the street with a cross at the end. Now, are we like that? If people get lost in life, can they look to you to help them find direction, to figure out where they're supposed to be going? That's our calling, is to be so bright that people see us in the midst of the darkness, that people see a difference, that that church is something different. There's, it, even a small light in a dark room makes a big impression. And so a place there like Thailand, where there's not a lot of Christians, a church like that, it's making a big impression. But we live in a dark world, at work, at school, in our different circles of influence, and we can make a big impression as well to be a light. Now, unfortunately, some people have a little more passion about their light. And instead of trying to illuminate, they use it like it's a tactical light, just to shine it in people's faces, to, to try to trip people up or bring judgment on people. I'm not saying that that's how we use our light. There's a difference between shining a light in people's faces and shining a light towards Christ. We want to lead people to Christ. It's not about us being right. One of the things that's helped me a lot when it's come to witnessing is to remember it's not about me. If people disagree with me, it's really not my problem. Now that may sound a little bit harsh, like I don't care. I do care about them, but it's not me they're rejecting. Right? It's like if you work, well, whether you work in in a company situation, in a military situation, if you're ordered by the company to go and to take a message, 
or by the government to go and to, to push an agenda of your government forward and whoever you're working with rejects it. Well, ultimately, it wasn't your agenda. It was what you were given. Now, you want to do your best job so that you're not fired over it. But if you've done your best and, and it's not accepted, it's not you that's being rejected. Now, sometimes they shoot the messenger. Sometimes they persecute those who bring a message. But again, I remember it's not me. And in the same way, I, as, as I witness to people, I have to keep in mind that it's not about me being right. If I can't convince them I'm right and they think that I'm foolish for it, then I can be foolish for Christ. What does it matter? Again, it's, it's not me that has anything to prove. It's between them and God. And so sometimes I think this happens out of pride. Like the Pharisees, who were always wanting to bring their legalism into view for people and, and tell people how terrible they were, what sinners they were. It was because they, were, they had their own pride. They wanted to puff themselves up and feel better about themselves. But we've got to empty ourselves of that and say it's not about shining in people's faces. It's about simply pointing people to Jesus. We read in 2 Corinthians that all this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. This idea of being Christ's ambassadors, again, it's God, not us, who's making an appeal. This week has been a, a big week with news politically. You probably heard on Friday that Mueller's report was finished and turned in. Now there's this big question of what happens next. And this investigation has been all about if Russian agents meddled in U.S. elections. Now, if that's the case, any Americans who participated are in huge trouble. And there's already been lots of people arrested, arrested and indicted and even sentenced. But guess what? If there's any Russians who are involved and they're in Russia, they're not in trouble. If anything, they're getting a raise. They've done a good job from their government standpoint. And my point is, the question is who you work for. Because if you work for Russia right now and it's found out that they had an impact on the election, well, your government's happy with you. But if you work for America and you help the Russians have an impact, you're being put in jail. Now, in the same way, we have a kingdom of darkness and a kingdom of light. And it all depends on who you work for. And if you're working for God as his ambassador, guess what? The world's going to hate you. Jesus said, the world hated me, the world will hate you. People will be against you, not because it's about you, but because of Christ. The Russians weren't serving what they personally cared about. They were serving what Putin cared about, what their government cared about. But there's a huge issue for Americans with that. So you see, in the same way, when we think about this as a kingdom of darkness and a kingdom of light, it all depends on which side you're on on who you're serving and who do you want to honor you. If we want honor from the world, we're going to serve the world. And to be friends with the world is to be an enemy of God. That's out of scripture as well. But on the other hand, if we're serving God, then the world will hate us as it's hated Christ. It doesn't mean that every step of the way we'll always deal with persecution. But it means we need to be aware that we could. Jesus doesn't say, oh, follow me, it's going to be easy. He says, don't worry. He says, don't worry, because when you're arrested, the Holy Spirit's going to help you. Well, that doesn't feel very comforting. How about, don't worry, I'll make sure you don't get arrested. But he doesn't say that. He says, don't worry when... He says things like, rejoice when you're persecuted, when you're beaten. That, again, it, it's, it's not a great appeal. If Jesus had some modern marketing people working with him, he could have made this sound a whole lot better. And a whole lot of people nowadays try to make it sound better. But unfortunately, that's not what the gospel is. The gospel is an invitation to die. Jesus says, take up your cross. Jesus says, those who follow me are going to have to give up their life if they want to keep it. It's not very attractive. And we don't help the gospel by trying to make it more attractive than it is. It's attractive because knowing Christ is the greatest thing we can have and gives us the greatest joy. It's attractive because it ensures us eternal life even if we have temporal difficulties and struggles. It's attractive because we find freedom from sin. It's attractive because we can know peace in our life despite 
the adversity that we may face. But to try to make it more than it is, to try to promise people that their life will be only good and easy if they follow Christ is a lie. Because the fact is, there are those out there who are looking for the agents of God and will make our lives more difficult. Another piece of, of news in the last few weeks has been the situation in Venezuela. An old president and a new president. And very slowly, more and more people are switching sides and leaving Maduro. And this last week it came out that several senior military officials are in talks about switching sides. But why do you think they're doing it? And the new president has promised that, they won't, that they'll, they'll be given amnesty, they won't be found guilty of any crimes if they switch sides. And truth be told, most people pick a side they think is going to win. People are inherently selfish, and many of the people that are holding out with Maduro think he's still their best bet. And as they see his power slipping, they go, oh, wait a minute, maybe I should switch sides. Sadly, it's very often out of self-interest. But that shouldn't be how we make our decisions. But if it is, if it is how we make our decision, then, well, wouldn't we choose the side of Christ because he's already won? If we're simply choosing the winning side, then that's God's side because we know he's ultimately going to win the battle. But how often do we choose the other side, the world side? How often do we choose to not do what God has called us to do, to not represent him faithfully? It begs the question, whose side are you on? Whose side have you chosen? Because ultimately there is one side or the other. You can't be in the middle on this. Just like you can't be in the middle in Venezuela. Just like Americans and Russians involved with the situation with Mueller, you can't just be in the middle and say, well, I'm friends with everybody. That, that doesn't help either. And in the Christian walk, we have to choose a side. Are we here to serve God or are we here to serve the world? Too many Christians try to be undercover Christians. But God has called us to live as ambassadors. That means out in the open, publicly displaying who he is. It doesn't mean that we're all evangelists. I don't have the gift of evangelism. It doesn't mean I don't evangelize. But some people have a gift of evangelism. Others of us, we're simply being a light, pointing people to Christ. I remember one time being on a flight with a friend of mine who's just got an incredible gift for evangelism, sees people saved all the time. And we'd sat down on our flight. We were flying from Houston to Paris on Air France. We had three seats on the side of a 7-4. And so it was, it was this young woman, myself, and my friend sitting here. And my friend's from Palestine. And he carries a backpack with him, which gets all kinds of great looks. And so as we're getting on the plane, he can't get comfortable because he's a little bit large. And we're in the exit row. And so if you know the exit row, there's the tables on the sides. So you have to squeeze in. And he can't get comfortable. So he keeps getting up and going to the galley to ask for water and getting cups of water and coming and sitting down. He seems agitated. And so one of the times he gets up, this young white, little white girl, or she's 20, I guess, but she looked like she was 14. So we didn't realize that she wasn't just a girl. She's getting nervous. And so when he gets up, she looks at me and she goes, do, do you know him? I said, yeah, I know him. She goes, is, is everything okay? And you can tell that there's some concern here about what this Palestinian with the backpack is getting all nervous and keeps walking around the plane for. And I said, yeah, yeah, we're, we're traveling together. She goes, well, what does he do? She's starting to ask some questions. You can see the nervousness. And I said, well, actually, we're going to a Christian camp. He's speaking there. And that gets her attention. By now he comes and he, he sat back down next to me. And she starts asking more questions. And frankly, we haven't even taken off yet. I haven't even quite gotten comfortable yet. I mean, I barely got my seatbelt on. And so I'm thinking, how do I get out of this conversation, being the wonderful, loving person I am, that's going, I'm not starting a flight from Houston to Paris and talking the whole way, please. And so I said to her, I said, you know, he used to be a Muslim, and now he's a Christian. You should ask him. And I pushed my button, and I reclined my seat. Unfortunately, it only went like that. But the idea was there. And so she looks at him, and she says, you know what? And he begins to tell his story. And I thought, okay, good, I'm out of this. In less than five minutes, he looks at her and he goes, and you can be a Christian too if you want to pray right now. And I looked at him and I'm thinking, dude, give it some time. Like you haven't even, I mean, you could give the Roman road, you could give some more time explaining, ask some questions. Before I could, I wasn't, I wasn't going to say anything. I'm just, I look back at her and she has tears running down her face. And she goes, yes, I want to do that. 
This guy's got the gift of evangelism. I have witnessed so many people on airplanes because hey, they can't get away. And I've never had that reaction. Maybe I'm doing the wrong thing. For the, maybe if I was Palestinian, former Muslim, I don't know. So there she is crying. And so there we are. Again, plane is not pray, taken off yet. And we're praying for her to receive Christ. Next thing you know, she tells us that she has brain cancer and is going for treatment. So now we're praying for her for healing. We're having a healing service on the plane. We still haven't taken off yet. At that point, they begin to get ready to, to push back from the gate. And my friend is sitting there, sitting there getting so excited. He already led one person to Christ. He goes, I think I want to get up and preach the whole plane. I went, no, no, dude. Let's get off the ground because you're Palestinian and that's not going not gonna to be good for us. So it's awesome, people that have that gifting. Not all of us do, but it doesn't mean we're not still called to be a light. When I was in, in Bangkok this week, I had a tour guide at one of the temples. And it's so easy just to be a light. Now, I know I've got it easier because I can tell people what I do. But there's also other ways. As, as this tour guide was leading me around, he was explaining karma to me. And I said, oh, I, I understand the idea of karma. I said, you know, as Christians, we believe that God, or the, I said, we believe you reap what you sow. But that's because we believe there's a God who brings judgment and makes things right in the world. And this began a conversation of how, what this was like versus Hinduism and, and Christianity and Buddhism. Now, he didn't pray to receive Christ there. Maybe if my friend had been there from Palestine, we would have gotten there. But the point was, I was just being a light. I wasn't forcing it into the conversation. He brought up karma. He's talking about it. I just shared my belief. And I said, oh, that's interesting. You know, what we believe as Christians, boom, boom. It opens the door. I'm just trying to shine some light. As Kurt likes to say, I'm trying to throw a pebble in his shoe. My hope is there will be other Christians that follow on and also bring things up. And it begins to agitate him in a good way. that he wants to know more and ask more questions. On my ride home at 11 o'clock at night on Friday, my taxi driver, I, I was talking to him from Sula Airport. And he said to me that he was from Rwanda. Well, I know most R Rwandese are Christians. I've been there. I've spoken in, in um, Christian leaders there. And so I said to him, I said, oh, are you, I said, are, are, do you attend church somewhere here? And he said, oh, no, I'm Muslim. I said, oh, okay. He said, yeah, most, most people from Rwanda, I know they're Christian, but me and my wife were Muslim. And I said, well, that's okay. You can still come to our church. And he politely declined. said, oh, I have to work on Sundays. But the point was, it's easy. Meet somebody from Rwanda. You know that Rwanda has a lot of Christians. Hey, do you go to church somewhere? It, it, I didn't even have to tell him I was a pastor. Just invited him along. The point is that we don't have to be like my friend on the plane. We don't always have to give an altar call. God may lead you to do that, but we can simply be a light, just in conversations. It should be so easy because if God is a big part of our life, it comes up. A couple of weeks ago, we were having a potluck, and I was in the kitchen back here, and I looked outside, and it was a huge crowd standing around a red car in a really giddy Kurt. And there Kurt was with a brand new Tesla 3, and a bunch of you were out there wanting to see the interior and sit in it and touch it and all this. And Kurt is quite happy to evangelize everybody about how Tesla is the best. Matter of fact, go tell Kurt after church that you think a leaf would be better. And see what kind of reaction you get. He will, he will evangelize you. You know, what's important to you in life? What is there that you are always bringing up? What matters to you so much? Maybe it's your home country. You like talking about how great it is back there. Maybe it's your car. Maybe it's vacations you've taken. Maybe it's something you do at work that you just love your job and that's so exciting. You see, if we're really excited about God, it should just come out naturally. Kurt didn't have to work up the courage to share about the Tesla. It just happens out of the overflow of his excitement. Shouldn't the same happen as we share the gospel with people? It should just come out of that overflow? The Bible says in 2 Corinthians that you are a letter from Christ, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. We're a letter that's supposed to be read by people, a letter from God that's being written so that others might know him. Back when this was written, letters were a, you know, the main mean of, means of communication to faraway places. Nowadays, we have the internet, we have Skype, and we have text messages and all sorts of things. But they had to write a letter, and they would seal the letter with whoever it was from, and they'd send it to far-off places. So Paul would write a letter and have it sent to the churches at Corinth, like this letter here. Well, he says in the same way, each of us is a letter that God has sent. 
And he has sealed us with the Holy Spirit, so it's clear that we are from him. But are we keeping ourselves closed up or allowing others to read us? If we go back one chapter in the same book, we read in 2 Corinthians chapter 2. At least I can read it. There we go. For, we can't see it on the back screen. For we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. 2 Corinthians 2, 15. You are the aroma of Christ. When you are around people, they should detect the sweetness of Christ. Now, there's a high order. Is that the case? When people meet you in the parking lot, when people meet you as they're driving, when people meet you on your street, when they meet you at work, do they sense the sweet fragrance of Christ? When I was flying through Abu Dhabi on Friday, I was getting some food in the lounge because I had an eight-hour layover, and one of the guys that walked in there to get food, he had been traveling a while, I think, because he didn't have a nice aroma. And I found I suddenly didn't have the same appetite. And I left the area where the food was until that guy was gone because I just didn't want to be around him. I was tired. I had flown in from Bangkok. I had this long layover. And I just wanted to get some food. And I'll tell you, you know how much an odor can be off-putting? How you just don't want to be around it? But on the flip side, when you have a nice sweet sense, a nice aroma that fills the air, it, it draws you in. So which one are you? When people are around you, are you the odor that, that they want to stay away from? Or do they draw in closer to you? Now, it's not because of who you are. It's the question of are you allowing Christ to live through you? To spread through you. We read in John chapter 15. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. As we think about how we can live out in the open, it's not about trying harder. It's not about having all the right tactics. There's things we can learn that can help us to be more effective. But it's ultimately about living out of the overflow. It's about what God has done in our life flowing out of us and being seen by other people. If we just try to force it, then we're not going to be able to accomplish and bear any fruit. But if we're focused on our relationship with God, if we're focused, focused on allowing the Holy Spirit to sanctify us and live through us, then He can do powerful things through us. And so my point here as we're coming to a close is, I don't want to emphasize how much you need to try harder. Yeah, you, we need to have courage. And sometimes, if you feel the Spirit's prompting, and you're not being obedient, you need to work on that. We need to be obedient to the Spirit's prompting to share the gospel, even when it may bring us embarrassment, might drive people away. But ultimately, it comes out of our fellowship with God Himself. That as we're doing that, He transforms us. He makes us into a light. He gives us that sweet aroma. And so if we need to try harder at anything, it's a question of, how is your prayer life? How is your Bible study? How is your time with God? How are you growing closer to Him so that, as Jesus said, out of you will flow streams of living water? He said there should be such an overflow of what God's doing in your life that it flows out into the lives of others. I always like recommending good books to read. Uh, so a book on this is the book Living Out of the Overflow. It's by Richard Blackaby, who I was with in Bangkok this past week. Many of you have met Richard. He's been here on occasion. Richard wrote this book uh, a year or two ago, and now I find that it's creeping into almost all of his teaching because he's realized just how essential that as, as he's been training leaders, he works with CEOs of companies like Delta and Walmart and Boeing, has just signed up for his leadership class, which is probably a good time for that CEO to get some leadership help. Um, might ought to cut that from the video, but anyway. Um, Richard does with CEOs, Richard does leadership with pastors and church leaders, and what he has found is as much as he can teach leadership, if you don't have that heart connection with God, you aren't going to be effective. Because if you're not in the vine, you can't bear any fruit. And so I'd encourage you, if, if this is something that's on your heart, if how can you better live out of the overflow? Pick up a copy of this book. 
and have a chance to look at how Elijah, he focus, focuses on Elijah and Moses and how they lived out of the overflow. Another writer that's one of my favorites is A.W. Tozer. Tozer said, The Spirit-filled life is not a special, deluxe edition of Christianity. It is part and parcel of the total plan of God for His people. D.L. Moody said that if you're not living a Spirit-filled life, you are living below your privilege. You're giving up privileges that God has given you. But are you living that Spirit-filled life? Or, or do you see the Spirit-filled life as something only missionaries have, or super-Christians, or just Sunday school teachers? Because this is what's supposed to be the normal, is that we're all living out of an overflow. You see, passion itself isn't enough. I love this story that's out of Acts chapter 19. It's a bit of a scary story. But it's a good one for us to remember. So Acts 19, starting in verse 13. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits. So these are some Jewish men who are not Christians, but they see that Jesus is working. That when Paul uses the name of Jesus, there's power in it. So they go, well, we'll try that. And they, they undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I adjure you by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims. Very formal speaking to demons here. Seven sons of a Jewish high priest named Sceva were doing this. But the evil spirit answered them. So they've gone and they are trying to exercise a demon. And the demon answers them and says, Jesus I know and Paul I recognize, but who are you? And the man in whom was the evil spirit leapt on them, mastered all of them and overpowered them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. You see, simply passion isn't enough. Jesus, when he tells the parable of the sheep and the goats, there are the goats who say, but we cast out evil spirits in your name. And Jesus says, but I never knew you. So while I want us to all have passion about sharing Christ, I don't want us to have passion about sharing Christ at the expense of a relationship with Christ. We have to get the horse ahead of the cart, so to speak, and not the cart behind the, before the horse. And so we've got to make sure that we are focused on a relationship with God so that we can grow in such a way that we can bear much fruit. Jim Lipinski shared, it's ultimately not the strategies that will, that will cause you to be effective as a, as a witness. It is the Almighty God working in you and through you. Jim shares a story in the devotional. As we close, I want to share this. It's a real life scenario as he's coached leaders all over the world. Well, what gets me most is his question at the end. Here's the scenario. It's a true story. You and your fellow executive team members are meeting to develop next year's plan. The CEO, who has been under pressure to show growth, says he expects 50% growth in your division, which drives 90% of corporate profit. You say this is impossible, even if your division won every deal in your industry next year. There's no way you can increase by 50%. You express concern to your CEO that staffing and expansion investment will be built on an unattainable plan. Your CEO takes you aside, stating that he expects you to support his projections if you are asked by the board chairman. This is a difficult situation for someone to be in. Who do they show loyalty to? But here's what got me. Was then, here's what Jim asked the question. He says, you show up on Monday morning in your workplace and you want to make Christ known, what do you do? See, his question wasn't simply what's the ethical or the moral thing to do in this situation. Those are the questions. But it was an even bigger question. In such a situation, in such a, a difficult place to be put in, how do you make Christ known? You see, that's the question we should be asking as we strive to be living out in the open. As you want to live your faith out in the open, how are you going to make Christ known in each situation? As you face situations at work this week, how can you make Christ known? As you're dealing with things with your spouse, or your children, or extended family, ask the question, well, how can I make Christ known in this situation? As you're dealing with neighbors, friendly or irritating, how can you make Christ known? As you're driving on the streets and 
People are driving far too slow like they were this morning as I had to go off to the island to Hoonvog to pick up my daughter. How can I make Christ known? Which was not what was on my mind at the time, just to be honest. But this is what we each need to work on. How can we make Christ known? So the first question is, are you living out of the overflow? What can you do to make sure that you are walking so close with God that He's filling you up, that you're so filled by the Spirit that it's just pouring out from you? And then the second question is, as you go walking in the Spirit, how can you make Christ known in each situation this week? Let's pray as the team comes back up and we have a song of response. God, we thank you that you have called us to be your ambassadors. Being an ambassador is a noble position. It's an honor. In the world, people are clamoring at the opportunity to represent their nations and be ambassadors and all the privileges that brings. And yet so often we, we don't really think about that role. We think about the job we have, uh, the position we have in our family, the things we have to get done, the chores, and yet our highest calling. You've given us all of this, a family, the chores we do, the work we do. That's all platforms for us to be your ambassador, for us to be your agent. We think about these agents affecting elections and trying to make sure that what their nation wants to happen will happen. Well, that's what you've called us to be, undercover agents. And yet so often we, we're serving the wrong side. God, help us to have a focus. Help us to be living out of the overflow, to be so focused on you that we are lights like the church in Bangkok with a glowing cross that people see us and they're, they're drawn toward us in their times of need. And that we point people directly to Christ. And in all situations, I pray this week you would give us each opportunities to make you known in our workplace, in our homes, in our communities. And help us to have the wisdom to see the opportunities you bring our way. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.